Hello, this presentation is called Potentials and Pitfalls for Machine Learning. An outline of the talk as follows. What is machine learning? Applications of machine learning. Comparing machine learning and statistics. What machine learning method to use for your particular application? Some pitfalls of machine learning and some resources for learning machine learning. What is machine learning? Many of the definitions of machine learning that you will see online are not accurate. Definition 1. This is a common definition. Machine learning is a way for computers to learn things without being specifically programmed. This is not true. Machine learning uses very specific programs, which are called algorithms. Definition 2. Machine learning is the study of computer algorithms that can improve automatically through experience and by the use of data. This is also false. The algorithms do not change through experience. What changes are the parameters of the model. In this way, machine learning is similar to statistics. So I will talk about the similarity. A more accurate description of machine learning would be, machine learning is intensive computation enhanced statistics. Now, statistics is the basic science of drawing conclusions from data, and statistic enables data-based decision making. A famous example was identifying a well that caused cholera in London by taking statistical data points of cholera cases. So statistics enables the transformation of data into decisions. Statistics was originally developed before computers, so it produces simple models with limited adaptability. Now, machine learning takes basic statistical modeling techniques and enhances them to produce adaptive and computationally intensive models. To use machine learning effectively, you must understand statistics first. If you use machine learning, it's also best to compare your results with a simple statistical model. Simpler is better. And to understand machine learning and understand the issues involved in a good machine learning met method, you must understand how statistics work also, because statistics faces miss many of the same issues. Some of the machine learning methods were developed by statisticians. Here are some similarities between machine learning and statistics. Both create computational models that describe data. If you're familiar with statistics, you know about regression, where you take a data, data points and you fit them to a line. Now, this is a model that describes the data. I can describe a data using mean and variance and a Gaussian distribution. Gaussian distribution looks something like this right? A bell-shaped curve. That's a model that describes data. Now, machine learning also creates models which are more complicated. Both specify models in terms of parameters. In a linear regression, the parameters are the slope and the intercept. Now, more complicated models will have more parameters. Both machine learning and statistics require sample data to make the models. You can't just make a model with no data. You turn the data into a model. Both machine learning and statistics are used for classification, clustering, and prediction. An example of a classification problem would be classify cells into cells with cancer and no cancer based on images of the cell. Uh, clustering would be trying to organize data into different clusters or groups. And prediction, for instance, you might want to predict stock prices or oil prices. Now, in fact, there is no clear line between statistics and machine learning. The two overlap and face many of the same issues. So here's an example of a statistics method and a machine learning method that is similar and derived from the statistics method. One common method in statistics is the decision threshold. Here I have two populations, a normal population 
in an abnormal population. And I subject these populations to a test. Now, the individuals in these two populations are mixed together. If I choose a new individual, I will want to determine whether that individual is normal or abnormal. The way I can make a determination is set a threshold, which is this black line. I take the result of my test on that individual, which is a number here from 0 to 12. This may be a chemical test, a biological test, or so on. And then I, uh, if the individual get, gets a 10, well, the 10 is above the threshold. So I will determine that that individual is an abnormal individual. All right? Now, sometimes I will be wrong, sometimes I will be right. There are some normal individuals that are above the cut point. The cut point is about 7. Uh, those are the individuals here. And that will be a false positive. There's some abnormal individuals who are below the cut point. That will be a false negative. All right, so I do have some possible errors, but I do have a way of making a decision. And statistics also gives me an estimate for how accurate that determination will be. All right. Contrast that with a machine learning method called k-nearest neighbors. Here's an example of k-nearest neighbors. I have this vegetable, I'm sorry, I have this, this new food. I want to decide if it's a fruit, a grain, or a vegetable. Now the data I have is how sweet is it and how crunchy is it. All right. Now you can see that uh, I have some previous data about fruits, grains, and vegetables. And my vegetables are very crunchy and not very sweet. My fruits are sweet and some are crunchy, some are not. My grains are not sweet and not crunchy. So I try to find the closest, the four closest individuals in my previous data. So app, here's one here, two, three, four. These are the four closest individuals in my previous data to this new data point. All right. It turns out that two of these previous individuals are in the vegetable class. So I determine that this new food is in the vegetable class. And in this case, I'm actually uh, right. This is a, a vegetable. All right. So what have I done here? I've made the decision based on a test or based on two features, sweet and crunchy. In the decision threshold, I made a decision based on one feature, which was the test result. Now this is similar. So it's... Uh, it's distance-based, uh, so in this case, it's if the if the distance is below or above the threshold. And here, I'm looking at close-by instances. In this case, I will need the entire data set in order to make each new determination. All right, here I only need the single threshold. Once I have the threshold, I can take any new data point and make my determination. Right. Here I have performance statistics, a true negative, true positive, false negative, false positive. Here I don't have a simple way of getting performance statistics. All right. So a difference between decision threshold and k nearest neighbor. Here I really would need a computer to implement this because every time I make a new decision, I have to look at my entire data set. All right, here's another example of statistics versus machine learning. Decision tree is a well-established method in statistics. Here's a simple example to decide whether or not you're going to buy a phone. You look at the first, first look at the price, then look at the memory, then look at the storage, and you have a criterion for making a decision at each stage. All right. Now this is a decision whether to buy or not buy. You can also use decision trees for classification. For instance, my example of fruit or or uh, foods. I take some food and I look at some criteria. I could look at sweet, not sweet. I can look at crunchy, not crunchy. I make a series of decisions and based on that I can classify my result. I may have multiple classes. For instance, apple, banana, uh, pineapple, orange, and so on. All right. So I have one simple decision tree and decision trees are computed using a systematic process based on a formula. 
the set of decisions is decided based on maximum information gain for each node. So this is a well-defined, simple formula that can be applied to create a decision tree. Now, this is a statistical method. What, re what uh, machine learning does is it takes this simple method and uh, makes it much more uh, sophisticated. It takes not just one, but multiple decision trees. And these decision trees are designed using a optimization process, not a formula, but a process. And this is an iterative process. You run this process several times on your data. And the, the, the decision trees are chosen based on the data. So when this uh, process is, is applied, you take any new instance, say a new piece of, a, a new piece of food, and then you apply these decision trees on all of these different trees. Then you get several determinations from the different trees. Then you take majority vote. So this in some way is similar to K nearest neighbor. And you get the final class. All right, so the difference here is that there's no uh, formula. Uh, there's no uh, simple set of, single set of decisions that you can point to because each one of these makes a, a different set of de decisions and will be deciding in a different order. Uh, there's, uh, the parameters here are very simple. There are many, many multiple parameters here that you cannot identify. And the training here is by an iterative process, not just by a simple uh, processing of the data, but by passing the data through multiple times through an algorithm. All right, so difference between statistics and machine learning. One more example is linear regression versus multilayer perceptron. Now, some people may not be familiar with this term multilayer perceptron. Actually, this is the basic structure of deep learning. Deep learning uses this kind of structure where you have levels and the data is passed from level to level using weights and activation functions. And based on the input data, which is passed through several levels, comes out as an output. All right. So uh, uh, this is actually based, uh, very closely based on linear regression. What does linear regression do? Linear regression takes your inputs and it, add, and it multiplies them by weights and takes linear combinations, adds constants, and then produces a result, which are the predictions. So you can take multiple inputs and produce multiple outputs. For instance, if you have multiple regression, you do need multiple outputs. All right. Multilayer multi -layer perceptron uh, does this repeatedly, and it adds a non-linearity. Okay. So these are two ways in which machine learning enhances statistics. Statistics makes linear estimates Machine learning adds a nonlinear uh, portion and also repeats, makes several repetitions. You saw also in Random Forest, there's a repetition of the simple statistics uh, algorithm. Okay. Now here, these weights are determined by a minimization formula. There's a, you are probably familiar with the regression formula. It's a simple matrix inversion. In this case, in order to estimate these weights, the, per, the system needs to be trained. You have training data that is used several times in order to adjust these weights to optimize the, uh, to optimize the prediction. So the algorithm is called backpropagation and it uses gradient descent. There's no formula for the weights. These weights also do not have names. Here, these weights are called regression coefficients, and they have interpretation. How much does this variable affect this output? That's the regression coefficient. Here, all of these weights, there are too many of them. They don't have any name. They don't have any direct interpretation. Okay. Here, we can also put error bars on these different weights. I can say this weight is 3.5 plus or minus 0.7. Here, there are no error bars on these weights. All right. So that's kind of a difference between, uh, between uh, statistics and machine learning. So let me summarize. Uh, statistics models are computed using formulas. The models are simple. Training and testing are accomplished together with the same data. 
and typically there's little risk of overfitting. Machine learning models are used an iterative process of optimization. You take special separate training data and pass it through a procedure several times. The models have many parameters that have no direct interpretation. Machine learning has been compared to a black box. You take your input, you put in the black box, the black box does something you don't know what it's doing. You don't really understand how the machine learning makes its decision. But there is a black box that involves many parameters and it produces output. Machine learning has training and test its testing separate. The training may also include validation. So you train and then you validate. How well are you doing? Uh, and then you try again. You train again, you validate again. Uh, you continue this process until the validation has no more improvement. Now, the reason machine learning has this separate training and testing is because of the overfitting problem. Yeah. You can compare training and testing to doing homework and taking a test. Right. The test is separate from the homework. In statistics, the, all you do is you do is the training and testing are one step. You only have homework. Here, you do homework and you have a test to make sure that the machine learning is really understanding what it says it's understanding. All right, so let me get into the more practical uh, aspect of my talk. What method do you use? This, of course, is a very, very important question. Uh, uh, you, can, you want to use the proper method for the proper application. So I give here two applications of a hammer. You know, a hammer is used to uh, put a nail or a sharp object into a, a fixed background. So here's a hammer. This is a hydraulic hammer that can that can then can hammer huge nails into the ground. Here's a small hammer that's used to ha to hammer a picture into the wall. You would not use this hammer for this application. Uh, you would destroy your wall. You would not use this hammer for this application. You would not f ever finish your job. You need to choose the hammer based on the nail. Unfortunately, in academics, too often people choose the nail that people. Uh, people already know what hammer they want to use, and they try to use it on every nail they can. Uh, this is not a very good procedure. If you have a problem or a practical problem, you need to look and be and see and investigate which machine learning method is going to be best for you. All right, so let's go. So, so uh, deep learning, of course, is very popular and has generated a lot of imagination. Deep learning is is uh, neural nets, convolutional neural nets. Uh, it's used for face recognition. It's used for uh, many, for different applications. Now, deep learning, uh, but you should not always use deep learning. Deep learning requires a lot of data. Uh, many people try to use deep learning on small data sets with 100 data points. This is not a good idea. Uh, you don't want a model with 1,000 parameters to describe 100 data points. Uh, you're, you're, going, you're just asking for overfitting. This is, so you, you, if you want to use deep learning, you need a lot of data. Deep, okay. Uh, now, sometimes you can improve your data set using some techniques like transfer learning or data augmentation. Uh, I'm not going to talk about that, but there are some techniques where you can improve your data, but uh, I do want to make this point that you need that, uh, it, that deep learning requires a great deal of data and many people try to use too little data for deep learning. Now, deep learning should be used with complex, subtle features that are difficult, difficult to characterize, such as uh, data in image format. Deep learning is very good for images. These images can be images of people, they can be photographs, they could be uh, medical, they could be geospatial images, or they can be image representations of other types of data. But, the, but deep learning is extremely good for image data. Deep learning is good for human-generated texts, the speech and music. Now, these are texts that have a complicated overall structure. Okay, this uh, is also used for data with large numbers of features, which may have complex hidden relationships, like uh, drug data or biochemical data, DNA, some things like this, where there are deep patterns that are difficult to see. All right, so deep learning may... Uh, be used there. Deep learning should not be used for highly random data, like the stock market. Some people would like to say, well, I can use deep learning 
to predict the stock market. Uh, if you're in business, you know a great deal of stock market is just random. Deed learning is not magic. It cannot produce something from nothing. Uh, unfortunately, many people don't understand this. Deep learning should not be used for smaller middle-sized data sets. It should be not used for data with a few features or a few alternatives. For example, if you have some, if you have an eight question yes or no survey that you're asking people, or you're trying to see if people have some health issues and based on eight questions, you don't want to use deep learning for this. There are too few features. In fact, there's an exact solution using decision tree that you cannot improve on. Mathematically, you can't improve on. Now, if you understand statistics, you can identify such situations. You can see whether there's a mathematical optimal solution for your classification problem. If you don't know statistics, then you don't know this and you try everything. So, I, uh, so statistics is important for choosing the right machine learning method. Now, if you don't use this, this uh, deep learning, what can you use? You can use conventional statistics or you can use classical machine learning, such as K-nearest neighbor, uh, reign of forest, uh, support vector machine, and so on. Don't jump to the fancy method. Simpler is always better. Simpler is always better. Try the simple first. If that's good enough, use that. Okay. So what machine learning method do you use? You need to understand your data thoroughly. Don't just take your data and, take, and run your data through the machine. Uh, another point I want to make is machine learning is not a substitute for human intelligence. Machine learning is an enhancement for human intelligence. You do still need to understand your data. You need to understand how the machine learning method you want is using the data. And, you want, and correlation is the key to selecting the method and selecting the features from the data that you use in the machine learning. Okay? All right. So here's a small parable that I can give. How do you look for a needle in a haystack? So here's a needle and here's a haystack. I don't know if you have haystacks in Oman. In Texas, we do. We have very large haystacks. A, a single haystack may have over uh, 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 a thousand kilograms of hay in it. Uh, and you can imagine putting one small needle into this haystack and trying to look for it. It looks about the same. Now, how do you look for a needle in a haystack? Well, one thing you can do is uh, try to identify features that are special about this needle. If you just do it visually, it's very difficult to find. If I use a magnet, then it will be much easier. Or I could use a metal detector. I need to use some detection method that is looking for the specific features of the needle. The same principle holds in machine learning. Okay, so I have a question. Well, okay, I'm not there quite yet. All right, so uh, let me, so, all right, so I'll skip this one. All right, now, so I have a question for you. Uh, can anybody tell me what this is a picture of. So I don't know if anybody can, I can open. Mm -hmm. It's an elephant, yes. Very good. That's excellent. Now, um, just see what, how amazing this is. How amazing is the human mind. Here, we don't have anything near like a complete picture. All we have are some clues, an eye, an ear, it looks like the end of a trunk, some uh, feet here. But the human mind is able to look at these individual features and match them with the person's idea of an elephant and identify the elephant. Now, in fact, this is exactly how uh, machine learning works. Machine learning looks for features in the data and it compares this, these features with a template or a memory of what of how these features should match with with uh, some examples that it knows. So the basic idea of deep learning is to correlate inputs with distinct, distinctive features. It looks at this here and it looks at its uh, memory of features and it tries to see if there's similarities. In statistics, this is called correlation. All right. So the the entire basis of any machine learning algorithm is correlation. Is comparing your incoming data with remembered patterns. Okay, so this is a little bit complicated. I'll pass over this, but this goes into the mathematical background of how this comparison works. Here you can see that in a uh, deep learning situation, in a neural network with multiple layers, 
each layer looks for more and more sophisticated features. Okay. If I have a four-layer neural network, these different layers may be looking at an image. This layer identifies edges. This uh, identifies local patterns like eyes, ears, nose, and so on. And this puts it together to recognize faces. And in this way, you can develop neural networks that can possibly recognize human faces. Okay. So in order to effectively use machine learning, you need to tell, you, you, you need, I can say, you need to pre-process your data. Uh, you don't just put your data in without thinking. What type of features are you looking for? Are you looking for features that are local? Are you looking for large features? Are you looking for segments, curves? Are you looking for enclosed areas, repeated patterns? You need to help the deep learning, the deep neural network look for these features. Okay. Okay, here's an example of license plate detect detection. Professor Salam is very familiar with this example. You are looking to read the letters on a license plate. Right? So you know what you're looking for. You are looking for letters. These letters are within a rectangle. So you want to identify a rectangle that contains letters. You want to separate the individual letters, and then you want to read the letters. Now, what do you know about what you're looking for? You know that it's inside a rectangle. You know that what's inside a rectangle consists of letters. You know that these letters are either numbers or Arabic letters or uh, 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 Latin letters. So you know what you're looking for. Accordingly, you need to, uh, you need to arrange your algorithm. First, you can... For you, and you arrange it according to the type of data you're looking for. First, you look for a rectangle. This uses an edge detector. Okay. Then you want to segment the, the writing within the rectangle into, into letters. So this takes uh, some, uh, some uh, character uh, segmentation algorithms. Okay. Then once you have individual letters, then you can use a uh, deep neural network to identify the letters. So you can see that the stages in this algorithm are targeted and arranged in order to match the type of data that's being used, that, that is being looked for. Another application of machine learning is time data, time series data. Now, you don't just want to apply machine learning to a time series. One very popular type of, uh, of uh, machine learning algorithm that is used for time data is LSTM, long short-term memory. Some people will simply take this long short-term memory and apply it to any data. And uh, this is not a good process. You should look at your data first, look at the features, and then uh, pre-process your data according to the features. So possible features include, is the data periodic? Does the data have persistent memories from a long time ago? Does it forget and then remember again? Are there sharp pulses in the data? So you need to guide your DNN's search. Uh, there's this story about the man looking for his lost key. He looks under the street light because it's easy to look there, but the key is not there. You need to show, you need to uh, arrange your features so that the machine learning algorithm is looking in the right place. Uh, the, the machine learning algorithm can look in the wrong place for a long time and not find the key. All right, so you need to arrange the algorithm. So here's an example of some data. This is data, sensor data from the temperature in a, in a room. So what do you notice about this data? All right. If you look at this data, you can see there are regular spikes. Okay, so this is an example of periodic. Now, there are sharp differences, so there are edges. Okay. So, uh, in fact, if you measure these, these, these uh, intervals are quite regular, about 2,000 iterations. And uh, so this is an example of periodic data. This is strictly periodic data. So what you should do is you, your, your method should certainly take into account the periodicity. Now, the person who analyzed this data did not. They used some method, and when they tried to fit the data, which is green here, they, they lose the periodicity because they did not include the fact that this data is periodic. You also need to understand why the data is behaving this way. Does this data here depend on this data back here? Well, this is, data, this is temperature data in a room. Uh, you do not expect the temperature in a room today to have any relationship whatsoever with the temperature uh, two weeks ago. It's a random process. There is no memory. Okay? 
Okay? So you don't want some method that uses memory from 1,000 iterations ago. You want some method that only uses a short amount of previous memory. So you need to adapt your uh, data, your features that you put into the model according to what you understand about the system. All right, All right so th there, as I said, there are different features that you can use and there are different methods that you can use to accommodate these different features. All right, uh, Simpler is better. One common application of machine learning is uh, text, automatic text processing, automatic translation. Uh, an application would be first story detection, looking at tweets and deciding which tweets are talking about a certain subject. Now, in order to do this, you need to represent your word data using mathematics. And these are called word embeddings. Right. So there have been many uh, uh, methods for word embedding, for changing words into vectors, into mathematical vectors. A, a uh, early version is this deep neural network-based word embedding. Very complicated. Right. It turns out that a very simple word embedding that basically uses a linear regression performs better than this complicated method. Now, how can simpler do better? How can simpler be more accurate? Well, if you have a simpler model, you can include more uh, elements in your model. Here, if I use a hundred different elements, here I can use thousands because this method is so simple. Uh, if it, you have more elements, since you can compute more quickly, you can include more elements. If you have more elements and more repetition, sometimes you can perform better. So simpler is usually better. Only add complication if you have to. All right. Now, okay, so suppose you have decided your method you will need to be very sure to quarantine your test data. Now that we have COVID, everyone understands about quarantine. Uh, if, you, if I travel to Oman, I don't know, maybe I need seven day quarantine, I don't know. But you definitely need to quarantine your test data and uh, separate it from your training data to avoid leakage. I like to use the example of an exam. If you want to give an exam to your students, you don't want them to see the exam before you give the exam. Otherwise, it's cheating. They'll perform very well on the exam, but this does not mean they understand the material very well. This is the same with machine learning. You have to keep your test data separate from your training data. Unfortunately, many people do not do this. Uh, there's, there are very subtle ways, uh, indirect ways, that the t training data can affect the test data. And this is called data leakage. Another thing that I mentioned before, you should establish a simple baseline. Understand the performance indicators and if possible, compute error bar. So let me give very simple examples of these. Uh, so, so sometimes, uh, so this is a, a study that we did on weather prediction data that in fact, 50% of the studies that we looked at had data leakage uh, because they took original data they did something to it, and then they split it into training and testing. But they did the same thing to the training and the testing data, so the testing data did, in fact, affect the training data. Okay. So this is quite a serious problem. Here's an example of data leakage. This is a published paper on antioxidant activity, so this is a biochemical paper, and you can see that their prediction is extremely good, very, very good. Their data points are here, their prediction is here. Now, why is their prediction so good? The answer is they used the very same, they, 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 they used basically the same data for training and testing. So they're testing the model on data that they trained on. This is like, as I said, it's like uh, studying for the exam and giving the students the exam to study for the exam. Of course, they can do 100%. And this is a published paper. And in fact, they published a second paper using the same method and the reviewer didn't see what they were doing wrong. So uh, uh, so this is a problem. Establish a simple baseline. Here's another application that I uh, 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 did with some colleagues on rainfall prediction. We did a survey of different methods. Out of 66 papers, 50% did not provide a baseline. That means that perhaps the method that they used was no improvement over a simple average. And in fact, we did a rainfall prediction uh, on image data 
uh, from uh, fr seasonal uh, image data. So we were looking at monthly rainfall prediction. And we found that, in fact, all the machine learning methods that we tried performed worse than a simple median of past data. So don't jump to machine learning. Don't assume that machine learning is doing better. Now, when you do machine learning, there are also different indicators that you can look at to see if your performance is good. One of these, when you're training deep learning, you have a training loss and validation loss. So as I mentioned, when you have deep learning, you have to repeatedly train your model. Every time you train, you validate. You see what the accuracy is. So here we have the training loss, and here we have the validation loss. All right, so here we have two curves. Now the question, what are these curves telling you? Are, is your training process good? The answer is no. There is something very deeply wrong with your training process. You need to understand what these curves are saying. In fact, this curve is like saying, I study for a test, I take the test, I get 60% I get correct. Then I study again. Then I get then I get 90% correct. Then I study again. Then I go back to 70. Then I go back to 20. Something is wrong here. You're studying you're you're studying the data, you're studying for the test, and here you're doing much worse than you did before. Okay? So this is not a, so this is there there's something very wrong with your training process. So you need to be able to look at these things and see what is this telling me about my model? What is not performing right? Ask yourself, does this make sense? All right. All right. Here's another example of time data. So this person fit, this, uh, fit the true value, which is yellow, with this red. The question is, is this red a good model of the yellow? And the answer is no, because they're using this a model to predict three steps ahead. I could simply take this yellow curve and shift it over three. It would be a better predictor than this red model. Now this red model, which is a very fancy model, is performing very badly. All right. So uh, if you don't understand what the data is doing, you would not see that this is really extremely bad model, and you can do much better with a simple model. Okay. So you need to understand your data. Give error bars. Uh, this is also lacking often in the machine learning literature. They, use, gave, they give several predictions, and they take the one that looks best, and they say this is the best prediction. Now here's an example of several predictors, and this vertical scale gives the error. 100 gives the error of the baseline, simple, me, simple me, median of past data. These others are different estimators that are used to uh, that are use machine learning to estimate the same thing. Uh, now here we have here we have 100. Here many of these estimators are worse. Here, the higher number is worse. This means the percentage error is higher. So 100 is the base percentage error. These have higher error. These have lower error. So the question is, is this blue method better than the baseline? Answer, no. Why not? Because the error bars include the baseline level. You cannot conclude that this blue method is better than the baseline. Now, in many machine learning papers, they would simply report the blue level and say that this one is better than the baseline. Right? It's not a valid conclusion. Uh, there are many papers comparing different methods which do not give error bars, so they really can draw no conclusions from their study. Okay? So I hope you can avoid these problems. Here are, all right, here's my summary. What machine learning method do you use? Let the data determine the method. Understand your data thoroughly. You need this in order to determine the method and also the features that you use in your machine learning. What are you looking for by the machine learning method? Correlation is the key to method and feature selection. Simpler is better. What are best practices in applying the method? Quarantine your test data. Make sure that you separate your test data immediately before doing anything. Establish a simple baseline based on statistics. Understand statistics and what the issues are. Ask yourself, does this make sense? Look at graphs and see if your idea is actually matching with what you expect. It's a good idea before you graph something to think, what do I expect from this graph? And if the graph does not follow what you expect, then you should go back and uh, see what's wrong. And if possible, compute error bars, as I did on this last slide, 
the, the error bars will tell you whether your, uh, sig your conclusion is actually significant. All right? So here are some resources. I, if you want to learn machine learning, I do recommend these Google tutorials. Uh, they have, you can write a code and the tutorial will uh, enable you to run your code and test and see if you understand what's happening. Now, of course, uh, the main language for machine learning is Python. And there are also uh, references for learning Python. So I think I will stop there. And I thank you for your attention. And I'm uh, happy to take any questions that you might have.